بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم اللهم افتح علينا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام وصل الله على سيد محمد وعلى آله الكرام ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم We were looking at uh, the book on shukr, gratitude. This is pretty amazing here. We got to the reality of shukr, which was taqwa. And then he said, shukr has two maqams. There's two stations of shukr. Maqam shakur which is the maqam of, like Allah says, وَقَلِيلٌ مِنْ عِبَادِي Shakur. Very few of my servants are shakur. The shakur is the one who's grateful for uh, calamities and tribulations. Not just blessings. He's actually, he feels gratitude when horrible things happen. Because most people just feel, at best they'll be patient or resigned. But the shakur, he actually says, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Because he knows that only Allah only does good for his believer. Right? There's a hadith in Sahih Muslim, Ajaban li amr al mu'min fa inna amruhu lahu kulluhu khair. How wondrous is the affair of the believer? His affair, all of it is good. Right? Like they say in the hood, it's all good. Right? That's what they say. That's like a modern kind of phrase. It's all good. I mean, they, what they need to learn is if you're a believer, it's all good. If you're not a believer, it's all bad, even the good. <laughs> but if you're a believer, it is all good. And that's why if you, if you really do believe that, you enter into a state of gratitude even for the tribulations. Alhamdulillah. And always a good thing to remember is Ibn Abbas said, no matter how bad it is, it could be worse. And there are people like that. There are people, even non-Muslims, you'll meet non-Muslims that are like that. They always look at the good side. Well, it could be worse. Think of this. Count your blessings. I mean, وَإِن تُعِدُّوا وَإِن تُعِدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْصُوهَا If you attempt to enumerate the ni'mah of Allah, you will never enumerate it. Right? لَا تُحْصُوهَا Now, just look at one ni'mah. Look at the ni'mah, for instance, of the eye. This is one ni'mah. First of all, think about this. Blinking. Just think about blinking. You don't even notice that you blink. Now, if you didn't blink, did you ever see pictures of, of Aristotle Onassis when he got old? He had to have the richest man, one of the richest men in the world, he had to have band-aids holding up his eyelids because he lost the muscle that returned the eyelid, and his eyelids just dropped all the time. So he had band-aids to hold his eyelids up, but then he had to put uh, drops in his eyes all the time, because if your eyelids don't close, they get dry, and you get dust in them. Because one of the things that blinking does is it, it brings the dust back down. It's like window wipers, right? You know those windshield wipers? It brings the dust down, and then what happens is the dust moves to the side and accumulates in the, uh, in the corners, right? So when you wipe your eyes, you'll get some little dust in it. You don't even think about that. It just, uh, that's just one part of the eye. But then you look, if you look at the eye, look at the, the nerve of the eye and how that developed, the myelination of that sheath, the fact that that there's synaptic response, the fact that, you know, there's neural transmission, because that breaks down for some people. We don't even think that. Think of the electricity, right? Also colors. Just think of colors. Just colors. Allah could have made everything black and white. Look at all the subtle colors that He put in the, in the world. And you can experience those. The eye can experience an incredible variety of colors, right? I mean, that's a ni'mah. And then look how some colors, you, they just give you pleasure seeing them. You don't even think about it. But there's a vibration. If you look, there are seven colors, right? I mean, all colors go down to seven primary colors. 
And so, I mean, in color theory, they'll go down to three, I think. But there's basically seven in a spectrum. So visible light, if you look at the visible light spectrum, each one of those colors has an effect on you. Red is a certain vibrational resonance, right? It's a lower resonance than violet. Violet is at the high spectrum. Red is at the low spectrum. Red, if you see red, it stimulates you. You don't even know that. They know that now in, in, in uh, color theory because they've done studies on people. If you put people in red rooms, it has a different effect than if you put them in blue rooms. It will actually change it because it's a resonance. There's an electromagnetic uh, radiation. That's all radiation. So it's having an effect on you. You don't even know it. Now, the thing about the world, if you go and look at green, green will make you feel good. That's why people love to look at grass or love to look at trees. It has a, you know, yun'ish. That's what the Arabs say. It's called rabia. That's why he said, oh Allah, make the Qur'an the spring of my heart. Rabi'a qalbi. It's a hadith. Allahumma ja'al al-Qur'an rabi'a qalbi. What does that mean? It means that thing that brings your heart back to life. Because spring brings your, your whole being back to life. You know, people start feeling good. People get what they call seasonal affective disorder. It's called sad. Right? There's people that get depressed in the winter time, but then spring comes around, they forget how depressed they were in the winter. They start feeling wonderful. Why are they feeling wonderful? Green. Colors start changing. There, there's photosynthesis. All that chlorophyll is starting to come back to life. Reactivate. Flowers. Look at flowers. I mean, what is that? A flower. Why do people like that? Smelling a flower, that's another scent. But just the eye to look at a flower, right? Or beauty, when an eye looks on beauty. Why do, why do we all respond the same way, right? When you see something beautiful. And most people share a common taste in beauty. If you see something beautiful, you're attracted to it. It's an attraction. Why? It's because beauty is an attribute of God. And what you're seeing is a reflection of a divine attribute. So you're attracted to the divine. That's the real attraction. The real attraction is not that, that ephemeral beauty that fades. It's what you're seeing, a manifestation of the divine in creation. That's the real attraction. But people don't realize that. I mean, that's where it's coming from. So the eye, all these things about the eye, and, and we don't even think about it. Look at the eyelashes and the eyebrows. They're serving a purpose. Eyelashes serve a purpose, right? I mean, when, when anything comes near your eye, you close your eye, and it, and it protects the eye. It's something amazing. So all these things, just the eye, if you start thinking about, and then there's all these na'am we don't even know about. We don't even know about it. For instance, light. Why do people get depressed? One of the reasons they think is because serotonin levels drop. Serotonin is a, uh, a, it's a, it's a, br a hormone in the brain that is released based on light, right? Cortisol. I mean, it's all light. So you, you're taking in light during the day, you don't even think about it. Melatonin uh, is also based on light. Melatonin is what makes you get sleepy. That's why people that have artificial light don't get sleepy. The eye is the one that's doing that. The eye is dictating. That's why you get tired. You get, it's all based on the eye. So even your sleep patterns are being affected by the human eye. You don't even know that. When you feel awake, when you feel drowsy, right? It's all a result of the eye. I mean, the eye, just the eye alone, if you start doing that and looking at the eye. You can't, you can't, I, there's no way you can enumerate all of the blessings. That's one ni'mah, ni'mah and, and But we don't, there's untold blessings in it. And it's one ni'mah. So the shakur is the one who shows that gratitude. But this comes from absolute certainty. And this is a, a maqam related to rida, which is contentment with Allah. And it's a state of mahabba. Because once you fall in love, you can't see anything else. I mean, that's the beauty of love, is that when you're in love, you can't even see faults. Right? Yeah, I mean, if you love Layla and anybody tells you, you know, Layla did this or Layla, you get angry. You know what? Layla would never do that. You say, no, 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 I saw Layla did this. You're lying. You're a liar. Layla wouldn't do that. 
That why? Because he's in love with Layla. No matter what you say about Layla, he won't believe you. That's real love. People don't even know that type of love anymore. Right? So if you're in love with Allah, Allah can't do anything that would upset you. Nothing. Because you'll say, it's myself, I did it to myself. Allah didn't do that. Allah wouldn't do that. I did it to myself. Or Allah's doing it because, like the father that punishes the child. You see, I mean, you see a father punishing the child. The father loves the child. So why is it punishing it? Because it knows that in the punishment is benefit for the child. It's disciplining the child. It's bringing the child back. It's reminding the child has bound. If you see a child running towards fire and the father slaps the child's hand, it wants to taste a light pain in order to avoid a great pain. You see? Because it knows that pain is nothing compared to the pain of the flame. And, and when Allah gives you great tribulations, those are nothing compared to the fire. Nothing. So if Allah is purifying you to prevent you know, to, to keep you from that, then you realize this is the love of a creator for his creation. And the Prophet ﷺ once saw some birds uh, being fed by their mother, and he, and he said, no, he saw a woman giving nurse to her child, and the Prophet ﷺ looked, and this is, the man of Allah takes discernment from everything. He takes ibra, right? Discernment, a lesson. There's a lesson in everything. Nadaruhu ibra. His glance is ibra. Wa karamuhu hikmah. And his speech is, is wisdom. There's a reason for why, why he speaks. The Prophet ﷺ once saw a woman nursing her child. And he said to his sahaba, Do you think that this woman would throw her child into the fire? And they said, La wallahi ya Rasulullah. That she would never do that. He said, Allah has more mercy for his servants than this woman for her child. Allahu arhamu bi ibadihi min hadir um li waladiha. Allah has more mercy for his servants than this woman does for her child. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about Nuh alayhi salam, innahu kana abdan shakura. He was a grateful slave. Look at Nuh, 950 years calling people to Allah and all they did was reject him. But he kept calling. Who could do that? I mean, people now, they get fed up after a week of da'wah. You know, these people, they'll never listen. I mean, this is 950 years doing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's shakur. One of the things also Marabd al-Hajj told me is from tafsir. But he said, Nuh never once went to relieve himself, except that he came back saying, Alhamdulillah, adhab anni al adha. You know, praise be to the one who removed this harm from me. Even just having shukr for, like, Samak once went to visit Harun al-Rashid. He was a great zahid and, and a wa'il. And Harun al-Rashid said, would you like anything? And he said, bring me a glass of water. So he ordered water, they brought him water. And he said, Ya Amir al muminin if if you uh, if you would be refused this water, what would you give for this water? And he would said, I would give half of my kingdom for a glass of water if I couldn't have it. He said, if you drank that water and then you couldn't re release it, what would you give to release it? He said, the rest of my kingdom. He said, what is a kingdom, a dominion, that is not worth a cup of water or uh, the release of it as urine. You know, what, what, what do you really possess? If, you know, he said, ما هو الملك الذي لا يساوي شربة ماء ولا إدرار بول It doesn't equal water or the flowing of urine. <laughs> so you think of that, you know, is the blessing of just eating and the fact that you digest it. You don't have to tell your hydrochloric acid to be released. You don't have to push any buttons here. Really, you eat something, and if it's protein, then it sends in, it breaks down the proteins down to amino acids, and then your body reassembles them as protein. If it's fats, it breaks it down to fatty acids, then your body reassembles them. If it's, uh, if it's uh, carbohydrates, it breaks them down to carbohydrate, takes them to the brain, right? If you have extra, the, 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 the insulin's released, takes it to the liver, 
and stores it as glycogen so that when you're out of energy, the, the liver will release the glycogen, break it down, and you, and you get carbon. You didn't have to tell the body to do any of that. And yet it's all doing it for us. Right now you're at 90. You know, I once had this man, I was telling him about Islam, and, and, and I said, well, Islam is based on being grateful to God. And he said, I guess I have a few things to be grateful for. That's what he literally said to me. He said, God's done some things for me in my life. And I said to him, who, who do you think's maintaining your body at 98.6 right now? And he went, Seriously, who, who's maintaining that? Why don't, why don't you want... Right now you could be in a fever. You could be shivering. Even if it, you could all be... If I was sick right now, la qadr Allah. If I was sick right now, even though it's a moderate temperature, I could be shivering right now, feeling cold. And it's not even cold. If I had a fever, I would be boiling right now in a moderate... You're all fine. But if I had a humma, if I had a fever, I would be wanting to take off all my clothes and... Really, think about that. You're, Allah is keeping you at, at this 98.6. Even if it's 100 degrees outside, your body's releasing fluid in order to maintain this 98.6 on average. It's going to be around there. If it's 100 degrees outside, why don't you boil up to 100 degrees? What created that inner thermostat that keeps you at that balance? If it's cold out, why don't you drop down? Because you will if you go out in ice cold and for long enough, you'll freeze. But for a, a period of time, you won't. You'll stay at 98.6. Right? Why? You can go swimming even and your temperature in a cold water, your temperature will, will, uh, will, will maintain, it might drop very slightly. And that's all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So showing gratitude. And then he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's a hadith that says, Yunadi munadin yawm al-qiyamah liyaqum al-hammadun, liyaqum al-muhammadun. That may let the people of praise get up. Fayaqum zumratun, fayunsabu lahum liwa' fayadkhulun al-jannah. Then a group of people will get up and they'll be given a flag, a banner. And they're, they're told to enter into paradise. And they asked the, the Prophet Man al Hamadun, who are these people? He said, Allah Ta'ala ala kulli hal. They're the ones that are always thanking Allah, no matter what their condition is. I mean, these are people on Yom Qiyam, you're gonna hear that. Somebody somebody call Hamadun, let all the people of Hamadun. Hamad is Mubalagha. It's called Sifa Mubalagha. It's a hyperbolic form in Arabic. It's Hamad, not Hamid. Hamid, everybody who says Alhamdulillah is Hamid. Hamad, they're always saying Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah ala kulli hal. Alhamdulillah ala kulli hal. Right. And in another riwayah, ala sarra'i wa darra. Those who praise Allah in good and harm, in ben- things that make them happy, things that make them sad. The second maqam is those people who look at those that are less than them in their worldly affairs, right? فِي أُمُورَ الدُّنْيَا وَأَحْوَالَ الدِّينَ فَيُعَظْلِمْ نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ تَعَالَ عَلَيْهِ بِسَلَامَةِ قَلْبِهِ وَالدِّينِهِ وَعَافِيَةِ مِمَّا أَبْتُلِيَ الْآخَرُ بِهِ وَيُعَظْلِمْ نِعْمَةَ الدُّنْيَا عَلَيْهِ لِمَا أَتَاهُ اللَّهِ So those who look at other people that are in tribulation and they feel great, grateful. That's less. It's a lower maqam. But when you see the thing about one of the ulama, he said, always look. In fact, no, there's a hadith. He said, the Prophet ﷺ said about dunya, that you should look at people who are less than you in dunya. Because you'll always feel grateful. Now, there's always people less than you. I guarantee you. You'll always find people less than you. Right? So you say, Alhamdulillah. I mean, if you don't have a lot of money, in this country we're rich. In the biblical times, to put a, a jar of honey on your table was a sign of great wealth. A jar of honey on your table was a sign of great wealth. Really. And now people, one man said to uh, Ibn Omar, he said to him, you know, I'm a poor man. And he said, do you have a house? He said, yes. He said, then you're not poor. He said, do you have a wife? He said, yes. And he said, you're wealthy. 
And then he said, do you have a servant? He said, yes. Because in those days, like now, you know, in some countries, you don't have to be wealthy to have a servant. There's a lot of countries, like if you live in, in, in Bangladesh uh, or Pakistan, even, you know, lower middle class people have really poor people as their servants. Because all they have to do is give them food and they'll work in their house. So he said, I even have a servant. He said, you are rich beyond, you know. So this is the thing. Here in America, the majority of people are, would be considered in any previous time, they would be considered living in palaces. The idea of having running water. In this country in the 1930s, still about 70% of Americans did not have running water. The idea of having running water, the fact that you can take a hot shower by just turning a, a knob. People don't even think about that. You know, in Mauritania, Wallahi, where Murabt al-Hajj lives, there's three women, Ayesha, Afia, and I can't remember the third one. Three women. Their job is to bring water every day. It takes them about two hours to go get the water. It takes them about an hour to fill it up. And it takes them two hours to come back, five hours every day, just to bring drinking water to their village. And that's their life. That's their life. They have to load the donkeys, right, with the qirba. When they drink water, wallahi, they say, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Ni'matul ma. Ni'matul ma. Alhamdulillah. Their water is. It's brown. It's brown. Most of them have uh, urinary problems because of uh, the sediment in the water. People have forgotten this. You know, I'll just give you an example. Wallahi, I read this uh, the other day. I was reading a letter, uh, and don't ask me why I was reading it, but I was reading a letter by Robert E. Lee, who was the head of the Confederate Army in the Civil War. And after his house had been taken by the uh, federal troops, his wife, he wrote a letter to his wife because she had to flee the house. It's a, it's a mansion now. You, if, if anybody's been to Arlington Cemetery, it's called the Custis Lee Mansion. Anyway, that was his house. And uh, it was captured. She had to flee. So he wrote this letter and he said... Uh, I reflect on all of the great blessings that we shared in that house and I feel fear in my heart that we did not show enough gratitude to God while that house was in our possession and for that, from his wisdom, he has taken it away from us. That's, that is the way Muslims used to think. I mean, th that was a Christian man, but that's how he thought about it. Because that, that's, that is hikmah. That's the way to think. You know, why did this happen to me? This is unfair. That's not the response. The response is, what did I do to lose this blessing? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Allah does not change a people until they change themselves. Allah will not take a blessing away from a people until they change something in their hearts. In other words, they, they don't show gratitude for it. Like the poet said, Allah, if you're in a blessing, then be vigilant about that blessing because disobedience will take that blessing away from you. So people used to know that. People don't know that anymore. They've forgotten that. Just the ni'mah of, of the houses we live in. Think about that. Really, the ni'mah of the houses we live in. The ni'mah of water. The ni'mah of food on our table. The ni'mah of clothes to cover our nakedness, to keep us warm. The ni'mah of a bed. You know, the ni'mah of being healthy. I mean, ni'mah al afiyah That you got up this morning and you weren't sick. Think of how many people got up this morning... They had to empty out a bag that had their, their um, urine in it. A bag that they have to change every day. Think of how many people got up this morning. Think of how many people that got up that couldn't go to the toilet 
or that bled blood. Think of how many people with asthma that couldn't breathe this morning, that woke up, you know, without... Really, think of how many people that spent their night coughing last night, couldn't sleep because of a cough. Really, that's why, I mean, the, just shukr, just showing gratitude for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just gratitude. I mean, this country, you have to wonder about this country, just the blessings that this country has been given, and the complaints of people, but also the Muslim world. Muslims complain a lot now. I mean, Muslims, there's still people, and the, of all the Muslim people that I know, the best ones that I've seen are probably the Mauritanians. The second best are the Moroccans. Moroccans are pretty impressive. And if you go to Morocco, you ask, because I, I, if you go to some countries, I'm not going to mention them, but I've been to some Muslim countries, because I, I always do this, it's a test of levels of gratitude. You ask the taxi driver how things are going, they start complaining. The gas is too high, you know, this, that, the government, etc., etc. You ask a Moroccan taxi driver, I'm serious. You get in a Moroccan taxi, you say, Kif, kif al ahwal? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Fi ni'ma. I'm in a blessing. I swear, you, they, you know, 90% or more of those guys, you ask them, how things, Alhamdulillah. Ni'ma. I was in one place in a Muslim country, and I asked this guy how things were going. He said, A'udhu Billah. He said, petrol is so expensive now, I'm not making any money. And I said, you know what? The complaint will make it get more expensive. If you complain about it, it's going to get more expensive. Like Americans, they're all grumbling about the price of gas. This is the cheapest gas in the world. They drive the biggest cars in the world. Look at the cars they drive. Some of these cars, I don't know how they get them in their garages. Do you know? And the bigger the car, the more arrogant the person generally. It's axiomatic. The smaller the car, the more humble. By the nature of cars. You know, people get in big cars, especially those big trucks that elevate them. Those people, it's amazing, some of those characters. You know, I'm sorry about truck people, but I've just watched them and observed them on the road. In fact, I just saw two people today. I was with Isa, and... You know, there's a lot of traffic, and there were two cars. One was a truck person, and I let him go. I didn't have to do that, but I just stopped my car a little early and let him get in the thing. He didn't even acknowledge me, not even a, you know, a wave. <laughs> That's fine, you know. If you do things to get thanks from people, you'll be disappointed. You know, but just to be human being, try to maintain our humanity out there, Right. So I'm, that's what I'm doing out there. Despite it all, I'm just fighting to stay human. Because I don't want to turn into one of those people. So he goes, car, truck guy, as if it's his right, you know. Of course I have to stop. He's a truck and I'm just a little car, you know. But that's the way he's... So he goes on, fine, that's fine. And I said, watch this next guy, small car. I told Isa, I said, he'll wave, right. So he goes on. You know, he gives me a wave like, thanks a lot, you know, because he sees your car's a little bigger than mine, you're letting me go, you know, whatever. I mean, it's interesting why people are like that, you know, but there's people out there like that, do you know? If you have people that have very fancy cars, it, <laughs> human beings start becoming oppressive when they start feeling independently wealthy. It's, it's just psychology. That's why a wealthy person that's humble is something very high in Allah's sight. Because the nature of, and that's the way a lot of people are out there. They're just arrogant. You know, they're really arrogant. There's people out there, they think they own the road. And, and you will see generally if he's got a 1965 Volkswagen Beetle, he doesn't have that psychology. He's just driving around trying to get where he's going. He's very humble and... But if he's got a Jaguar, you know, this or that, and he's out there with that arrogance. And it's all about thinking that I'm independently wealthy. It's a ni'mah from Allah. If Allah gives you wealth, it should humble you. It shouldn't make you arrogant. It should do the opposite. Because you look at other people out there and you feel, subhanAllah, I don't, you know, you, you, people say, what did I do to deserve this? They can do it both ways. If somebody, horrible happens, they say, what did I do to deserve this? You exist. That's, that is enough as a crime. 
right? Really, it's enough as a crime to think that you exist beside Allah. You are a criminal. Because la ilaha illallah, there's nothing worthy of worship but Allah. And yet here you are walking around thinking this little contingent creature that is totally dependent for every breath, for every instant on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he thinks he's independent. If you're in a state of heedlessness, you are a criminal. If you forget Allah for one instant, you are a criminal and you stand condemned. And anything that happens to you, you deserve it because you've forgotten who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Ya ayyuhi insan, ma gharraka bi rabbik al kareem. What has deluded you about your Lord? What, what has deluded you about your Lord? Why are you in a state of ghurur, delusion, thinking that you don't need every instant, you don't need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just to take the next breath, to have the next heartbeat? The heartbeat, what activates it? An electrical impulse. Who's activating it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You think it's your brain? It's not your brain. Your brain's not doing that. They don't even know what's doing it. You can cut all of the heart. You can cut all of your... Uh, nerves to the brain and the heart still beats right there's some people doctors I, Aisha you studied physiology huh? who's a doctor here are you a doctor yeah what makes the heart beat seriously tell us and all this knowledge they gave you at the university what makes the heart beat do you know physiologically what makes it beat Right, there's, a, there's a electrical activity, there's no doubt about that, right? But what, what makes that be, why? I mean, you, well, I mean, no, but seriously, how can you explain that beat? They don't even know why cells, heart cells start beating at a certain point. They beat before the central nervous system is even formed in the infant, right, in the embryo. What makes those cells just start beating? Not only that, if they cut them up, they've done these experiments. They cut them up and separate them. They start beating on different beats. They br if they bring them back together, they synchronize again. Right? I mean, that's one of the things... Uh, that's in uh, that book, uh, Evolution's End. He talks about that. Look at the hadith of the Prophet. When he told people to close ranks in their prayer, because he said, if you don't, your hearts will differ. One of the things about people that are close together, their hearts synchronize. We know that now. Seriously. Your breathing will synchronize. Women who live in the same house will start having the periods at the same time of the month. They synchronize. It's well known. If you live in close circulation with people, you begin to breathe as one. And that, look at that hadith. Stay close together in the prayer line. If you don't, your hearts will be different. Because you want to beat together as one thing. I mean, look at this hadith. As if they're a well-structured house. They fight together in one rank as if they're a well-structured house. What's a well-structured house? It's well-designed. Muslims fight based on strategy, on thinking, on design, right? military art. They don't just go out and do things without planning. He gave you the blessing of is, you were just like those mushrikeen. You were just like that before, and then Allah gave you the blessing of Islam. What, what do you, why, why do you think you're so different? I mean, the beauty of Islam, from, from one of the many beauties, but one of the beauties of Islam, and this is what I love about Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayyah, Islam, you see, there's two ways of embracing. There's the embrace of an equal, and then there's the embrace of a superior. Did you ever think about that? What's the embrace of an equal? Well, I mean, you embrace somebody who's the same as you. Like if I embrace you, you're my brother, you're a little bigger than me, but we have an equal embrace. I put my arms around you, you put your arms around me. What's the embrace of an inferior, a superior to an inferior? The child. The child can't put his arms around you. You pick him up and you embrace him and you hold him. See, that's Islam. Islam can take all those other religions and just embrace them all. God is so great that God will even allow somebody that denies Him to exist. I mean, that's greatness. 
He'll feed him, nurture him, give him rain, keep his body healthy, give him a wife, children that love him. Allah will do all of that and that person denies God's existence. All that does is it, it shows the greatness of God. Now, if, if, if you can't let that person survive, it's like there's a story, it's an apocryphal story, I don't know how accurate, but there's a wisdom, Imam al-Ghazali mentions it, about Ibrahim alayhi salam. One night, a, he's, he never ate alone, Sayyidina Ibrahim, ever. He always found somebody to eat with. But one night, he couldn't find anybody. He went out and found a man, and he brought him. He was a mushrik. And before the man ate, he blessed his food in the names of his idols. And when Ibrahim heard that, he said, you can't eat any of my food. You're an idol worshiper. Get out of here. The man left. And then Allah revealed to Ibrahim that that man, I have been feeding him for 40 years and patient with his idolatry. You couldn't be patient with him for one meal. And so Ibrahim went and found that man and apologized to him and invited him back to his table. And the man asked him why, and he told him, and the man became Muslim. That's Islam. We can embrace them. You see, da'wah, what is da'wah in Arabic? What does that word mean, da'wah? It's an invitation. Now, if I put a gun to your head and say, you're coming to dinner tonight at my house, is that an invitation? Seriously, it's not, is it? That, that you're not inviting somebody, you're forcing them to come. La ikraha fid deen. An invitation is only valid if you allow the person the possibility of refusing the invitation. Now, who would allow the person that possibility? A generous host. Allah has made a house, He called it Darul Islam, and He invited His creation to it, and He gave them the option to refuse to come to the house. So if people refuse it, why, why are you so fearful of them? Why, why are we so afraid of those people? You should have no fear. The, see, the thing about people that are ignorant, they fear that. That's, that's what a fundamentalist is, is somebody who's afraid of the other. He's afraid of having his iman. He's so afraid, and his, he's so afraid that he won't even allow for the other to exist. He can't. He's not going to allow that possibility. He wants them eliminated. Really, and that's a disease. That's why Islam is the only religion that's ever allowed other religions to exist side by side with it. You study the history of religion. Christians never did it. This, all this tolerance now, it came from uh, John Locke, who wasn't even a, he, he didn't even like Christianity. Or David Hume, who didn't like Christianity. That's where they got all this ideology. You think these founding fathers were Christians? See, Christians now, they brag about how great Christianity is in America, we're number one, blah, blah, blah. They don't even realize that this is all anti-Christian. The whole thing was founded based on people that rejected Christianity. It really was. Thomas Jefferson wrote a gospel called the Gospel According to Thomas Jefferson. And he took out everything that bothered him. <laughs> I mean, that's blasphemy. You tell a fundamentalist that, he'll say, that guy's going to hell. Well, why are you boasting about him? as this great patriot and great American, if he's going to hell. Seriously. So where did they get those ideas? The Muslims had those ideas centuries before the Christians. We got it from our book, La Ikraha Fid Deen. There's no coercion in the religion. Because we are not afraid. But now the Muslims are so empty. They have no knowledge of their religion. They're threatened by all of these ideologies out there. You see, really. Because it's all, there's no, see, if you're, on, you're not on solid ground, you're afraid of the slightest wind. If your house is made of, of uh, you know, in, in West Africa, they have these houses made of, of uh, grass, right? If your house is made of grass, you're afraid of wind. If your house is made of stone, you think wind bothers you? Wind doesn't bother you. You're not afraid of it. It's not going to do anything to you. But now we're afraid of it. Because our house is no longer solid. It's not on solid foundation because we've displaced our teaching. We don't have educated scholars anymore. We don't have mutakalim. We don't have theologians. You think we have any theologians in the Muslim world right now? I'm serious. Most of these Christian theologians that, that, that are really well trained, because I've read some of their books, they have brilliant, they have geniuses still working in theology. 
they would wrap rings around most of these so-called Muslim scholars. Because Muslims don't even know their Tawheed anymore. Really. That's why Muslims are so fearful of all this stuff. Because we've lost our tradition. We don't learn it, we don't study it, we don't think about it, we don't reflect on it. So that's the second maqam of shukr. And then he says that the basis of lack of, of gratitude is ignorance. وَأَصْرُ قِلَّةَ الشُّكْرِ الْجَهْرُ بِالنِّعْمَةِ It's ignorance. See, if, 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 if you're ignorant, you don't realize how much blessing you actually have. And if, if you don't realize that, then وَسَبَبَ الْجَهْلِ بِالنِّعْمَةِ قُصُورُ الْعِلْمِ بِاللَّهِ And the reason for ignorance about your blessing is your lack of knowledge about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. First of all, what is the greatest ni'mah? Well, what precedes even Islam? Existence. Ni'mat al-ijad, that he has given you existence, consciousness. What a ni'mah. Really, people will say, oh, I don't want that ni'mah. Why? To have, just to be conscious. To have a, a, a conscious, you're, you're a sapiential creature, to have the ability to think. What a ni'mah. What is the next ni'mah? Ni'mat al-imdad, that he sustains your existence. Right? I mean, I read this, yeah, I was reading this book, it's called The Atheist's, the Atheist Debater's Handbook. And it teaches atheists how to debate religious people, right? Don't, I wouldn't recommend reading it. But, I mean, it's, it's interesting if you're, you know, I think, for me, it's just understanding how they think. You know, because if you're confronted with that, the thing about a Muslim scholar or a da'i or anybody working in, in the field, you have to be prepared for questions for you really do and you shouldn't be afraid I'm not afraid because I've studied my deen I've studied Tawheed I'm not afraid anything they throw at me I'm not worried about it but in this book he said he was talking about the ar the cosmological argument which is the favorite argument of Muslims right and he said these he said these people argue that everything is contingent upon something else and then he says which is that's patently false for instance, human society is not contingent upon anything other than humans. Right? This is his argument. So he's giving somebody fuel. Right? So he says human society is only needs humans. Right? So it doesn't need anything outside of humans. So there's something that's not contingent upon anything other than the thing itself. So he said, so why should the universe not be contingent upon anything other than itself? That's his argument. That's, a, that's in the Atheist Debate. It's published by Prometheus Books. And they published very anti-Islamic books as well. They published, there's this guy, Ibn Warraq. Right, you know that guy? That's Prom Prom Prometheus Books. They published a book called The Problem of God. Right? <laughs> well, I mean, they admit he, God is a problem. And for them, he is a problem. He's going to get bigger and bigger. <laughs> the problem. Right? But anyway, so look at that argument. All right, well, human society is not contingent upon anything other than humans. What about space? You can't have humans without space. So that's not part of, that's outside of humans. Your space is outside of yourself. You occupy space. Without space, you couldn't exist. What about time? You can't have human society without time, right? I mean, it's, it's an, a ridiculous thing. So they say, well, the universe doesn't need anything but itself. The universe needs space. Well, the universe is space, dummy. Right? Well, wait a second. What was there before there was no universe? Nothing. So the universe needed space to exist in. Right? Doesn't it? I mean, the universe can't exist without space. The, so if you're going to say universe is space, well, what was there before the universe? Nothing. Well, so it had to fill something. Right? And space is dependent on what? What is space dependent on? Matter. You have to have something to fill the space. If there's nothing that fills the space, there's nothing. So everything's depending on something outside of itself. Right? I mean, this is, this is just thinking things through. But this is the nature of a sophist. The nature of sophists is that they make, what, what Socrates was asked what a sophist was, he said they make the better the worst cause look like the better one. We call them lawyers now. 
right? Lawyers, that's what a lawyer does. He can take the worst case. They say a jury is 12 people who decide who paid the most for their lawyer. Right? That's what they do. They just decide who was the most eloquent, who was the most convincing, and that usually is the one that cost the most money. Not always, but usually. So, ignorance about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and mu'nim. Why are you ignorant about Allah? Tarqa tafakkur fi ni'mihi. See, you have to reflect on the blessings of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to reflect. He says, the Prophet said, لا تفكروا في الله ولكن تفكروا في آلائه Don't reflect on Allah, but reflect on the blessings of Allah. What does that mean? Not to reflect on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not to reflect on Allah. You cannot conceive, you can't conceptualize Allah. You can't. You cannot, your intellect is finite and you cannot conceptualize the infinite. You just can't do it. And therefore, it's haram to think about Allah. You cannot think about Allah. Uh, Sayyidina Abu Bakr said, Al khawdu fi kunhil ilahi ishraku. That to reflect on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his nature is shirk. Right? And the incapacity to conceptualize Allah is conceptualizing Allah. In other words, the fact that you know that Allah is laysa kamithrihi shay, you know who Allah is. When you know there's nothing like Allah, you know who Allah is. That's why the, the Prophet said about the end of time, in the end of time, he said, if everything gets confusing, know that your Lord does not have one eye. Right? So anybody that tells you that this is God, it has one eye. This can't be God. Right? This is not God. But they call it the almighty dollar. People die for it. Fisi be the dollar. Really, they'll die. Shahidu dollar. People will kill for this. It's a piece of paper. You can light it on fire and it disappears. You can't do that to gold. Gold doesn't disappear. I and mean, if you're going to worship something, worship gold. You know, this is not worthy of worship. Neither is gold. But I mean, if you're going to compare the two, get it straight. This is not money. This is not real money. This is monopoly. It's a paper game, right? But they've convinced people that this has intrinsic value. It doesn't. They just print them up. That's why things get more expensive every year, because they just keep printing it up, right? It's not money. It's not God. And yet people worship it. They'll die for it. They believe that their sustenance comes from this. They believe that. There's people that think that the only reason they can buy food is because they have money in their pocket. Don't worship the sun and the moon, but worship the one who created the sun and the moon. Right? لا تعبد الشمس ولا القمر Don't worship the sun or the moon, but worship the one who created the sun and the moon. Don't worship the, the dollar. Don't worship gold. Worship the one who created all those things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَذْكُرُوا آلَىٰ اللَّهِ لَعَلَكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ Remember the blessings of Allah. What is the greatest blessing of Allah? Of all the blessings, what is the greatest blessing of Allah? As really the Prophet is the greatest blessing. He's the greatest blessing. He's a ni'matul kubra. He's a ni'matul uthma. That is why reflecting on him is the highest thing that you can reflect on in this world. Because he has the qualities of human perfection. He has all the akhlaq. He has the akhlaq of divine attributes. That's why Allah called him Ra'ufun Rahim. These are two attributes of Allah. He's not divine, but he is the most generous of those humans that can show generosity. Nobody was more generous than Mara'itu Akram min Rasulillah. I never saw anyone more generous than the Prophet of Allah. I never saw anybody more gentle. Mara'itu Aliyana Arikatim min Rasulillah. I never saw anybody more gentle than the Messenger of Allah. Right? The, the Prophet was gentle in his nature. So reflecting on the Prophet attributes, his qualities, that's why. Uh, learning his sirah, learning his shama'il, all of these things will draw you closer to Allah. I, uh, really, they'll draw you, and they'll make you love him more and more. 
The more you find out about him, the more you have to love him. And that's why the most ignorant people of him are the furthest from Allah. And those who know him the most are the closest to Allah. Really. And that's why even one of them said, whoever sees me will enter paradise. It's a, it's a shatha, it's a famous statement of somebody, I don't want to... But somebody, one of the ulama heard that and he said, Abu Jahl saw the Prophet and he goes to hell. And they told this man that and he said, Abu Jahl lam yara Nabi Allah, ra'a yatim bani Hashim. He didn't see the Prophet of Allah, he saw the orphan of Bani Hashim. Had he seen the Prophet of Allah, he would have been for paradise. You see, to see someone and to see their reality are two different things. And, and so seeing the Prophet ﷺ is seeing who he was. And he was afdaru khalqillah, the best of Allah's creation. So he is ni'mat al-kubra, right? Because without him, you wouldn't know Allah. Had it not been for him, you wouldn't know Allah. وَلَوْ لَلْوَاسِطَ لَذَهَبَ كَمَا قِيلَ الْمَوْسُوطِ Had it not been for the means, you would have not known the end. That's why, why did Allah say Muhammad Rasulullah to become Muslim? Yeah. Why wasn't it just Ashadu an la ilaha illallah? Why not that? Really think about that. Why do you have to say, Wa ashadu anna Muhammad Why, if shirk is the only thing Allah won't forgive, why did he make his tawheed, Wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah? And I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. That's part of tawheed. You can't have tawheed without that. I guarantee you. In our understanding of, of Tawheed, ilm Tawheed is three things. It's the ilahiyat, the nabuwat, and the sam'iyat. Right? If you don't believe in, in, in the yawm qiyamah, that's, you, your Tawheed is not complete. So knowing Allah is one is not enough. You have to know who taught you that. Because the, the Jews and the Christians no longer know Allah is one the way we know Allah is one. The, the Christians believe that He's three in one. And the Jews believe that he has parts, right? The Jews actually believe, uh, they have anthropomorphism. If you study Jewish theology, they have anthropomorphism. They believe that Allah is in space. Spa if you're in space, then you, you fill up, you need space. So you're dependent. How can Allah be in space? But then you say, well, then that means Allah is nothing. No, that doesn't mean Allah is nothing. It just means you can't think of what Allah is. <laughs> because all you know is space So you assume everything has to fill space That's only because you're analogically reasoning with your intellect But when we speak about Allah There's nothing like Him So all we know is He doesn't have space We don't know His nature Because we can't know His nature But we know his, the negative aspects We know the salbiyat right? So Allah has existence without space Now he says, if you forget the ni'mah, uh, if, you, if you're ignorant of a ni'mah, you don't know it. And if you don't know it, you don't give gratitude. And if you don't give gratitude, it gets cut off. So you have to know the ni'mah of Allah, because you'll lose them. What does he say? The first, the, the, the root blessings are four, right? The first blessing is the nutfa, because all of living creatures came from it. In other words, you were initially a zygote, and Allah brought you forth from a zygote. Zygote is just, it's a, two proteins that come together and form the first cell. That's what we were initially. And then al-harth, Right? This is a blessing. Everything that was brought out, Allah brought forth from the earth was, was the blessing of bringing forth all of the plant life, the vegetative life. So the first is animal life, and then vegetative life. Right? And then what he says, the next is al ma. Right? Because without water, there's no animal or vegetable life. So you have animal life, vegetable life. And then you have the blessing of water, without which neither can exist. And then fire. Right? Because fire, with it you have light that you can see and live. And then you have all the blessings of food from it. Right? 
And then also because for the people of inner sight. And he said, this is why all four of them were mentioned at the end of Surah Al-Waqi'ah. وَهَذِهِ النِّعَمْ هِيَ الَّتِي ذَكَرَهَا الْمُنْعِمْ فِي آخِرِ سُورَةِ الْوَاقِعَةِ وَأَضَافَهَا إِلَى نَفْسِهِ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ See, why did he... I mean, look at this. وَمِنْ أَفْضَلِ النِّعَمْ وَأَجَلِّهَا نِعْمَةُ الْإِيمَانِ From the greatest of blessings and the most exalted is the blessing of Iman. ثُمَّ نِعْمَةَ الرَّسُولِ And the blessing of the Rasul. But see, Iman also comes from the prophets. Do you see? In other words, if you didn't have prophets, you wouldn't know what to believe. So recognize the, the blessing of the prophet. There's no doubt our belief is, is our greatest ni'mah because by it we will enter paradise, inshallah. But the blessing of the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa is that he came to, to teach us this iman, alhamdulillah. ثُمَّ النِّعْمَةَ Quran. And then that he brought us out from the best of all the, the, the nations, right? See, we could have been Muslims from Bani Israel, which is a great blessing, but it's not the blessing of being Muslims from the Prophet's Ummah. We could have been Muslims from the, from the Nasara. It's not the same as being Muslims from... We could have been Muslims from the time of Ibrahim, which would have been a great blessing, but not the same as being from Habibullah and Mustafa. So that is a great blessing to be from the people of Islam. Now, if you look here at these, these blessings, because th I mean, just really think about this. Right? Have you reflected on what you tumnun? That goes for men and women, because the woman also, uh, the she has that as well, right? Both men and women have this imna. The woman is the ovary, and the man it's the semen, right? And that those two come together. And the Prophet ﷺ taught us that. See, people didn't know that the woman had a role, in they thought you know they didn't know that before that. So he says. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَفَرَأَيْتُمْ مَا تُمْنُونَ Have you considered what you, what comes, ejaculate? Have you considered that? أَأَنْتُمْ تَخْلُقُونَهُ أَمْ نَحْنُ الْخَالِقُونَ Did we create it or did you create it? Right? I mean, have you reflected on it? Did we create it? Or did, in other words, نِعْمَةَ ijad. Did you bring yourselves into existence or did we bring you into existence? Reflect on that. That's, that's the asul al-ni'am al-nutfa, right? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, نَحْنُ قَدَّرْنَ بَيْنَكُمْ الْمَوْتَ أَأَنْتُمْ تَخْلُقُونَ وَنَحْنُ خَالِقُونَ نَحْنُ قَدَّرْنَا بَيْنَكُمْ الْمَوْتَ وَمَا نَحْنُ بِمَسْبُقِينَ We have determined amongst you your lifespans, and we will not be stinted in that determination. Right? Ah, that you will replace the likenesses of you. We will bring you again from something you're not even aware of. Now this, Shaykh Abdullah bin Bayya said, is even the possibility of cloning is in that ayah. Because he said, we can change the way you're being created. And we'll create you a different way. We're still doing it. If you have a test tube baby, we're still doing it. <laughs> you take your ovum out in an operation, you take your semen out, and you put them together in a test tube baby, replant, we're still doing it. Don't get deluded. You think you can clone? Don't get deluded. It's still Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? We'll change your likenesses in things that you don't even know about yet. 1400 years ago. And you know how you were first created. Would that you wouldn't reflect on this. Right? You, you knew how we first brought you about. 
There will be other ways, which is also an indication we can bring you about in the next world, because that's what the initial tafsir was. Have you thought about what you're cultivating? Are you doing it? Are you cultivating this? Or are we cultivating it? Because you go out, you put the seed in, you cover it with earth, you water it. Did you do that? Or are we doing it? In other words, all you are is a sabab. But who's really doing it all? Who gave you the ability to walk? Who gave you the strength in your bodies from your food to do all these things? Who did it all? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَوْ نَشَاءُ لَجَعَنَّهُ حُطَامًا فَظَلْتُمْ تَفَكَّهُونَ إِنَّا لَمُغْرَمُونَ بَلْ نَحْنُ مَحْرُومُونَ So, had we wanted, we would have made it all chafe. In other words, you plant it and we just destroy it. Look at all the things that can happen once you plant. Allah can send locusts, they eat it all. He can send a drought, kill it all. So you think you're doing this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, then you'll say, oh, we're mahrumun. No, now we're, we're deprived. Right? So you think you're doing, it's all to remind people you're not doing anything. Don't get deluded about this. Now look at this. Haven't you thought about water that you're drinking? Haven't you reflected on the water that you're drinking? Antum, Right? Did you maintain it in the clouds? Right? Are you the one that brought it up into the clouds? Or are we the ones that brought it down to you? Did you do it or did we do it? Right? I mean, now think of the hydrological cycle. Right? All that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doing that. And then, ni'mat nar Right? And then Allah reminds us, had we wanted, we would have made it bitter, brackish. Would that you would just show gratitude. This is all about gratitude. That's all Allah is saying. Look at the fire that you're bringing about. Did you bring that fire about or did we bring it about? Who dried the tree? Right? Why does the tree change? It goes, you can't light a, try to start a fire with a living tree. Really, try to do it. Try to start a living tree on fire. Who dried it out? Right? Who made it flammable? Did we do it or you? Right? We did this as a tadkira. And a way of making travelers have ease in their journeys. The ability to light fire on a cold night when you're traveling. Say subhanallah. I mean, really, reflect on these and then say subhanallah. I mean, look at that. Who thought? This is, this is a, a man, right, unlettered from the Arabian Peninsula. This is just one small verse. And he's saying, think about those four ni'am. The ni'mah of your fluids, your vital fluids. The ni'mah of your agriculture that gave you those vital fluids. The ni'mah of water that gave you the agriculture. And then the ni'mah of fire that gives you benefit from... from and then, And I swear by the where I've placed the stars. وَإِنَّهُ لَقَسَمُ لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ عَظِيمٌ this is a great oath if you but knew. Look up into the sky. It's a great oath. Now they tell you, oh, that star's 400 million light years away. I mean, traveling 186,000 miles per second, it would take you 400 million years to get there. And they know that now. 400 million light years. Did you see what he said at the astronomy thing? You know what he said? I don't know if people were paying attention. Right? You know what he said? He said... If when you look up in the sky, all you should see is light. Because when they take their telescopes, the closer they get, the more dense the light gets. If, did you see those pictures? Remember they showed us how the sky should look? Remember they said that? How the sky should look at night if, if it was following normal physics. That's why they got the idea of dark matter. Because they realize only some of these lights are penetrating. What's happening? Why are only some of them penetrating? 
وما أدراك ما الطارق النجم ثاقب the night and the light visitors the stars that visit you and what will convey to you what those visiting stars are the ones who penetrate in other words there's all these ones up there that aren't penetrating but there's ones that are called طارق who taught him that who taught it why does Allah swear an oath about that والسماء والطارق who ever thought of that by the heavens and those night visitors وما أدراك ما الطارق in other words their light is visiting the earth and what will convey to you what a night visitor is because the Arabs knew what a night visitor you know what a night visitor is a طارق he's the guy that knocks on your door at night he shows up that's what a طارق is but that's not the طارق Allah is talking about والسماء والطارق وما أدراك ما الطارق النجم وثاق the, the star that pierces and comes to the earth. Really, it's, you know, it just goes on and on and on. You just, I'm serious. You just start looking at that book and you'll just start seeing it. just goes on and on and on. I mean, why don't they believe? Because they've never even examined it. When I was 16 years old, I came to the realization that the only reason I was a Christian is because I was born in a Christian family. I realized that. I said, the only reason I'm a Christian is because my parents told me Jesus was my Savior, blah, blah, blah. Right? That's the only reason. I realized that. I just realized. I, I thought, if I was born in Sri Lanka, I would be a Buddhist. Because my parents would tell me, here's your God, and pray to him, you'll get whatever you want. If I was born in Israel, I would have been a Jew, maybe, or a Palestinian. Who, but I realized that. I realized at 16, I remember very clearly that realization the only reason I'm a Christian is because I was born a Christian. And then I thought, I should think about this. And then I thought, okay, let me look at these world religions. And I took this class in world religions at, the univers- at a college. And we had the book by Houston Smith, World Religions, right? Religions of Man or something like that. And I started reading about this. I think, they have one billion followers. What do they believe? They have this. And I started thinking about all these different religions. I started studying them. And then I remember hitting on Islam. I thought, now wait a second, what's going on here? And then I went and I got a Quran and I read the introduction. I remember saying, the whole of the Islamic creed is summed up in the statement, there is no God but God, and Muhammad is his messenger. And I went, what does that mean? You know, really, what? there is no God but God. I mean, that's such a strange statement when you first hear that, you know? I don't know about people in here, but the first time I heard that, I remember thinking, I wanted to know what that means. There's no God but God. I mean, now I know what it means, but then, you know, I was thinking, what does that mean? I mean, it's better to translate, there's nothing worthy of worship in reality but God. But there's no God but God is a very strange translation. But I remember it just, and there was something very intriguing about it. No God but God. And I remember started saying, there's no God but God. He was kind of like some kind of Zen koan. Like, what's the trick here? Do you know? What is it? What's, like, what, what am I supposed to realize here? And then I realized what it meant. I, I just, that's it. There's no God but God. It's, that's, that makes perfect sense. There's nothing else that can be worshipped but what's, Worshipped in truth. لا معبود بحق سوى الله. That's how our ulama interpret it. لا معبود بحق سوى الله. There is nothing worshipped in truth except Allah. Everything other than Allah that is worshipped is worshipped in by falsehood. But then the second one, well, Muhammad Rasulullah. Muhammad is the messenger of God. What does that mean? Who was that man? Then you start reading about that and you realize. This is amazing. You know, why, and why haven't we been taught this? Because I remember when I became Muslim, I wrote my father a letter. And he wrote me a letter back and he said, because he, the first thing he did, he read Gibbon, The Decline and Fall of Roman Empire. He, he, he read the section on Islam. And Gibbon actually, despite some of the things that he says, he, he preferred Islam to Christianity. And he does say that it's a great religion. And he talks about the theology of Islam makes a lot more sense than the theology of Christianity. So he read that and he wrote me the letter saying that 
our ignorance of Islam is historical. You know, we should know more about this religion, the fact that it had such a massive impact on the world. Why don't we know about that? I mean, really, why don't people know about the Prophet Muhammad as a, as a historical, they, everybody knows about Napoleon. Do you think Napoleon had more impact on, on human history? People know about Napoleon. They know about Waterloo. People know about, you know, Michael Jordan. Really, they know he's the greatest basketball player that ever lived. Americans know that. Americans know about, you know, General Grant. They know about uh, Sherman, you know, the defeat of Atlanta. And they know about all these things that are so insignificant in terms of human history. And nobody, yet yeah, you ask them about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, yeah, no, that's that, that's that crazy religion, right? Really, why is it crazy? Well, that guy Osama bin Laden. <laughs> well, now wait a second, let's follow this through here. Do you remember that guy down in, I mean, I'm not comparing, but I'm just saying same logic. Do you remember that guy down in Waco, Texas? Which guy? That guy, remember that guy that, you know, David Koresh? Oh yeah, that crazy guy. Well, wait, wasn't he a Christian? Well, he said he was. Right? Well, okay, so you mean he doesn't represent all Christians? No, that would be stupid. To, so does Osama bin Laden represent all Muslims? I mean, same logic. By just a simple... I was on a plane once, and my, my wife, we were in that... Uh, you know those uh, where they, you face each other? Southwest Airlines. You face each other? And my wife was facing this lady. And, and about halfway through the flight, she just kind of blurted out. Because I was wearing a hijab, you know, and she had her baby with her. And she looked at... She said... Did you ever see that movie with Not Without My Daughter? That's what she said. So I, I looked at this lady and I said, what do you mean by that? And she said, well, we, you know, it was about these Muslims that like kidnap babies and things. And I just said to her, I said, have you ever looked on your milk carton? You know that thing that says missing on the back? Or you get those things in the mail that say missing? She said, yeah. I said, do you get them regularly? She said, yeah. I said, it's amazing, huh? Now, if you read it, it'll say, like, Toby Smith, last seen with Kelly Smith, right? So who kidnapped her? The biological parent. Because they're almost all those kidnappings are divorce situations. And I just said to her, you know, Americans are kidnapping their babies all the time. I mean, that's why they're... So just because a film was made of a guy who happened to be an Iranian, who happened to want his child to be raised in his culture, in his land, so he took his kid to Iran. One case, right? I mean, do you think that all Muslims are like that? And she says, well, I guess not. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, blah, blah. But I mean, I said, if they would teach logic in their public schools, just teach them how to think logically. It's really sad. People can't think anymore. You know, every time there's a, uh, like a terrorist thing, uh, all the, like, I have a friend who's an Egyptian, uh, he does Egyptian tours. Every time there's a terrorist event in anywhere in, in the world by Muslims, all his flights to Cairo, the people cancel them. You'll be, you'll be much safer in Cairo than you would going into San Francisco today. You have much better chance of surviving a day in Cairo than a day in San Francisco. Really. But they, people can't think anymore. It's like getting struck by lightning. You know, I mean, who, who's, it's, you know, it's very highly unlikely that you'll be struck by lightning. So if, don't start worrying about it. Right? But it's all fear. That's what shaitan ya'idukum al-faqr. Shaitan ya'amurukum al-fahshah. Shaitan is always about fear. Don't go there. Those are dangerous people. I mean, people ask me, aren't you frightened going to the Muslim world? I said, I'm frightened living in America. If I'm going to be frightened, I'm going to be frightened about realistic concerns. Right? Really. I mean, I'm, I should be worried about living in California. We're on the most, the most incredible fault line on this planet, according to geologists. It goes right through Hayward, California. Right, it's probably right under Zaytuna Institute. <laughs> It's the biggest fault line on the planet. If I'm going to start worrying, I should worry about that. But why worry? I mean, what, whose hands are we in? Really, whose hands are... Am I in my hands? 
خلقتم انفسكم يو نو جي اي مين ار يو بروتكتينج يور سيلف ريلي اتس اول كريزي سو جست بي جريفل جست سي الحمد لله وشكر لله ستارت ثانكينغ الله